Greetings and welcome to this video on the ship classification frigate and basically how the term frigate has come to describe a lot of ships that don't really have that much in common with each other, um, some of which are small ships similar to what we normally think of as a frigate and others of which are large ships basically akin to a destroyer. Um, this video is a companion to one that I already wrote for my website on the same topic so if you'd rather read than watch a video, um, the link to that will be in the description below. Now, in the Cold War, the term frigate had pretty clear definition. And putting aside the U.S.'s um, use of the term frigate pre-1975, which was atypical and didn't fit with other navies, frigates, including American frigates after 1975, were generally relatively small 2,000 to 4,000 ton displacement ships, oftentimes optimized for a specific role, especially anti-submarine warfare. There were a lot of anti-submarine warfare frigates built. And in general, air defense capabilities of frigates were relatively limited. Um, the Oliver Hazard Perry class had pretty good air defense capability, but still not um, up to par with a contemporary destroyer, for example. And reflecting this was the fact that many of these frigates had relatively simple air defense systems, really designed for point defense. For example, the Knox class frigate um, initially had the basic point defense missile system, BPMDS, which was pretty lackluster. Um, the British had the Sea Cat, which also had its share of issues. And the Soviet, fr you know, frigates such as the pictured Krivok class had the SAN-4 Gecko. So these are kind of sh short-range point defense systems for ship self-defense and maybe defense of things in the immediate proximity. Definitely not designed for any sort of wide area air defense capability. And not on par with what, you know, cruisers and destroyers and dedicated air warfare ships were mounting at the time. So basically the point of all that is to say there was a pretty clear distinction in terms of kind of size and capability between what you'd expect from a frigate and a larger ship such as a destroyer or a cruiser. But now that distinction is really kind of breaking down and this is due to, it's due to a number of things. The advent of vertical launch systems and, you know, the ability to have smaller but still highly powerful radars, especially air certs radars, has enabled ships that are not quite destroyer size to pack a significant punch and fulfill basically the same role as a destroyer, but in a smaller package. So the two ships pictured here are a great example of that. In the foreground is the Spanish Alvaro de Bazan class frigate. Sorry, I probably butchered that. And in the rear is a U.S. Navy Arley Burke class destroyer. And in the middle, just ignore that. Um, <laughs> basically, both of these ships are actually quite similar. As you can tell, the Arley Burke class destroyer is a bit larger than the Alvaro de Bazan class frigate. But both of them as you may be able to tell, have the same radar system, the SPY-1D. And this is connected to the Aegis Combat System, which the Alvaro de Bazan also has. And the Aegis Combat System is designed for area air defense duties. It was designed for ships to protect a carrier fleet. So basically what you have is a frigate that is essentially a small destroyer. It's basically a destroyer with slightly less missiles, but the same radar and the same combat system. And this is something that is relatively new, and this is a phenomenon we're going to be exploring a bit more in depth. So let's take a closer look at the Alvaro de Bazan and what makes it very destroyer-like in terms of capability. So as we already discussed, it has a full-size SPY-1D radar set. Not the SPY-1F frigate version, but the full-size SPY-1D, the same one used aboard U.S. Navy destroyers. And this is a highly capable radar set. The U.S. destroyers are about to get um, the new flight. Three Arleigh Burks are about to get a new set, but the SPY-1D is still very formidable and gives excellent air, uh, area air defense capability. 
Their weapons are held in Mark 41 VLS cells, which are the full-length cells also used aboard U.S. Navy destroyers and cruisers. And the Alvaro de Bazan class has 48 of these VLS cells, which is much less than an Arleigh Burke class destroyer, which in all its variants has 90 plus VLS cells. But when compared to some other destroyers, the 48 VLS cells of the Alvaro de Bazan class actually looks pretty good, including, funnily enough, Australia's Hobart class destroyer, which is based on the Alvaro de Bazan class and also has 48 VLS cells. So in this case, we can see the distinction between the destroyer designation given to the Hobart class and the frigate designation given to the Bazan class is basically a purely semantic thing. They have the same number of VLS cells, they're based around the same platform, they look quite similar, and in all major ways, I mean, the Hobart class is newer, and so I'm sure it incorporates some, you know, improved capability over the Bazan class, but the point being, both ships are basically the same size, with basically the same radars, and the same number of VLS cells, yet one is a frigate and another is a destroyer. And the next two classes of destroyer-like frigate I want to talk about are the Danish Iverhuifilt class and the Dutch D7 Provincian class. Again, sorry for the pronunciation on those. Um, I'm going to talk about these as a unit because they both share a relatively similar role and configuration. So both are very competent air warfare frigates, so they have excellent area air defense capabilities. And that's provided by two radars. The SMART-L is a long-range volume search early warning radar, and the APAR, or Active Phased Array Radar, is a kind of mid-range X-band multifunction radar able to provide target tracking, horizon search, um, missile guidance, etc. And both these ships use the Mark 41 vertical launch system. The Ivor Huifelt class has um, 32 Mark 41 VLS cells in addition to Mark 56 VLS cells for 24 evolved Sea Sparrow missiles. And the D7 Provincian class has 40 Mark 41 vertical launch cells. And in terms of their radar configuration, these ships are quite similar to a destroyer, the British Type 45 Daring um, class, which uses a smart L derivative for its volume search and um, has an APAR type um, radar in the Samson. Now let's look at firepower, and specifically surface-to-air missiles. Um, as many of these ships are primarily air warfare ships, or a significant portion of their role is air defense, um, we're going to look at their anti-air capabilities here. And in terms of anti-ship missile capability and land attack capability, a lot of these ships are really quite similar, so we're just going to focus on um, air defense here. And what we can see is that some of the large frigates we've been talking about in total actually boast more surface-to-air missiles than some small destroyers. So on the left we have our large frigates, and on the right we have some smaller destroyers, including the Chinese Type 52C, um, the British Type 45, and the French and Italian Horizon, which is using the same missile loadout as the Type 45, so I included them as one entry. And then, of course, we have the Hobart class, a derivative of the Albaro de Bazan, so they have um, the same missile loadout. And basically, the way that these frigates are achieving such high overall missile numbers is through the use, as you can see, of the Evolved Sea Sparrow Missile, or ESSM. And in the Ivor Huifelt, these are stored in a separate launcher, as mentioned. Um, in the D7 Provincian and Albaro de Bazan classes, they are actually quad-packed, so basically four ESMs, ESSMs can be put in um, one Mark 41 vertical launch cell that would normally house one SM2. Because they're small, uh, you can do that. And so you might be saying, okay, that's not a fair comparison because the ESSM is a small missile, it's not equal in capability to something like the HQQ-9. And to some extent, 
that's a fair criticism, although I would say in most cases it actually doesn't really matter, and this is why. The great thing about the ESSM is that it's highly effective in one of the most common roles that air warfare ships are asked to carry out now, which is defense against uh, anti-ship cruise missiles. And many modern anti-ship cruise missiles are stealthy and they're sea skimming. So they fly low, uh, right over the ocean, and they have a relatively low signature. And the thing about these missiles is that even the best radars, because of the radar horizon and the clutter of the sea and many other factors, these missiles are very difficult to detect at long range. It's basically, you're going to be detecting them relatively close, even if you have a good radar. So in many cases, by the time you've you've, you know, spotted one of these small, stealthy sea-skimming missiles, it's already within range of the ESSM. So at that point, the ESSM is basically offering you equal capability to something like the SM-2, because the extra range of the SM-2 is basically extraneous. The missile is already well within range of the ESSM, and the SM-2 wouldn't really get you anything extra. And assuming that a large portion of your missiles are expended against uh, incoming anti-ship cruise missiles, the ESSMs are basically not going to be offering you any less capability than a full-size missile like the SM-2. So that's why I would say this is a fair comparison for many of the um, kind of saturation defense tasks that, that you might expect a modern you know, air defense destroyer or frigate to, to uh, perform. So anyways, um, that, that aside... You can see that these large frigates actually offer kind of superior magazine depth and can engage more aerial targets than some of the smallest destroyers. So I guess that's the main takeaway here, is that the line in terms of firepower between these large frigates and some of the smaller destroyers is really quite blurred. Um, and you could argue that in some situations, a loadout like that of the D7 Provincian is going to serve you better than something like that of the Type 45 or Horizon destroyers. Now you might be thinking, okay, so there's an overlap between the largest frigates and some of the smaller destroyers in terms of capabilities, but what about smaller frigates? Is anyone still making frigates more kind of with a Cold War displacement, 2,000 to 4,000 tons? And the answer is yes, those are also still being made. And one great example is the South Korean Incheon class frigate, uh, which is pictured here. And for air defense, all it has is a rolling airframe missile launcher with a range of a few nautical miles. So really just designed for kind of self-defense, point defense, which is very different from, you know, the large frigates we just looked at, which are robust area air warfare ships. Um, and instead, it, this ship boasts a robust land attack capability. So you can see at the bow of the ship, we have a 5-inch naval gun. The same one found aboard the... Um, the Arleigh Burke and Ticonderoga class destroyers and cruisers. So this is a gun usually found aboard ships displacing 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 tons. Um, but here, it's on a ship displacing 3,000 tons. So very, um, very kind of robust land attack capability, naval gunnery. And also, this ship has eight surface-to-surface -surface missiles, um, cruise missiles which is also quite substantial for a ship displacing only 3,000 tons. So here you can see kind of another approach to frigate design, one which emphasizes, you know, offensive firepower, naval gunnery, naval bombardment, and supporting land-based operations, and has, you know, the traditional kind of destroyery area-air warfare role is deleted. It's just point defense. And the last frigate type I'd like to discuss is the Chinese Type 54A. And unlike the Incheon class, the Type 54A is more of a true kind of multi-role frigate. It, busts, it boasts um, a robust air defense capability, substantial surface-to-surface um, -surface capability, and also it has anti-submarine rockets, so good anti-submarine capability as well. And this ship does all of this while being relatively small and affordable. It only displaces 4,000 tons. Um, and this is achieved through the usage of a smaller VLS than the one used aboard Chinese destroyers. And it also has a different smaller radar as well. It doesn't use the big ASAs that you get aboard the destroyers. It uses a smaller rotating set. And so here you can see the Chinese approach to kind of the high-low mix. You have the big high-end air warfare destroyers, um, such as the Type 52C, Type 52D, 
And then you also have these smaller frigates, which can be more cheaply produced and can do kind of medium range escort duty type stuff at a very affordable price. And China made 30 of these very rapidly. Um, so this is a design that's well suited to long production runs and it's very versatile. Anyways, I think that's about it for this video. And if there's any one main takeaway, I think it should be that you should treat the designation of frigate with some amount of skepticism. If someone says to you, this thing is a frigate, your first kind of instinct should be to say, what type of frigate is it? Is it an almost destroyer, you know, frigate built by a European Navy for their flagship? Or is it kind of a smaller, low component of the high-low mix, such as the Type 54A? Because these kind of two destroyers, I mean two frigate types, <laughs> even I'm confusing them now, these two frigate types perform very different roles. Something like the Ivor Huifelt or the De Seven Provincian class, that's a flagship. Those ships are the most capable, the largest, and you know, the most expensive surface warships of their navies. In contrast, something like the Type 54A is a lower end combatant designed to have, you know, solid multi role capability but at a lower price than the higher end ships such as the destroyers and the cruisers. So, yeah, they're basically, they're kind of two different types of frigates that are being made now. And the point of this video is to kind of, I don't know, explore that a little bit, um, to demonstrate the overlap between the large frigates and the smaller destroyers. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And I welcome any feedback. If I made any mistakes during this video, nobody's perfect, so I may have made an error. Um, please don't hesitate to comment. And I will pin any corrections. I, um, I will put any corrections in a comment and I'll pin them so that hopefully, you know, you can see them and the record will be corrected. Um, yeah, and uh, one other thing. If you enjoyed this, you might enjoy my website, so check that out. There will be a link in the description. And also, if you have any ideas for videos I should do in the future, I'm always struggling to come up with ideas and, you know, figure out what people find interesting, what would people want to watch. Um, so yeah, any suggestions for future video ideas or how to improve the content, please drop them in the comment section. Thanks, and I hope you enjoyed.